Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part three of the Value Methodology webinar series. My name is Allison Moe, and I am the Marketing Manager here at Catalyst Connection. Today, our presenter, James Bolton, President and Owner of Bolton Value Consulting, will be discussing the proper use for VM tools. James Bolton, the President and Owner of Bolton Value Consulting, has worked with many organizations globally for 20 plus years to build successful and sustainable internal value methodology methodology programs. In July 2014, Jim began his own value consulting business and has since helped many additional organizations utilize value methodology and build their own internal value methodology program. Jim is a past president of SAVE International, the Global Value Methodology Technical Society, and is currently the executive director of the Miles Value Foundation. Before we begin the webinar today, I would like to remind you all that if you were to have any questions during today's presentation, please type in your question or unmute yourselves and you can ask your question at that time. Um, if there's any questions entered into the chat option, I can review them at the end of the webinar. Thanks, James. I'll pass it over to you now. Thanks, Allison. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my third uh, lesson, a third session uh, with the value methodology. And I'd like to kind of open it up. I know, May, you have been part of the last two sessions that I've had. Uh, and I know uh, we had some time for questions in the last one, but uh, I don't know if anyone on the phone right now before you start today might have a question on either the first session where we just gave an overview of the methodology and how it's used and the usefulness of it and some examples or the last one where we talked about how to get started with a, a value methodology program internally and some of the things that are necessary to get that program started, up, things to know and understand up front. So anyone have any initial questions before we get started? Okay, hearing none, let's get started with our third session here. Uh, this, this is going to focus today on really how, to, how these various tools are used, and I'm really kind of specifically talking today about the tools used in the value methodology, how, how the value methodology tools used in an actual workshop to help support this process and make this process different than any other process that you might be exposed to, any other type of a value improvement process. Okay, so we're going to start with our, our first slide here, and um, this talks about the use of the value methodology tools, which we want to focus on today. And um, information, we want to review uh, the information with the team. Um, in the information phase, we want to talk about marketing information. We want to talk about competitive analysis. Uh, these the expanded build material, the current material and type of for the manufacturing process used, some sample components. These are the things that we review in the information phase, drawing specifications, final analysis, supplier internal uh, quality issues and warranty issues, uh, product level competitive benchmarking review, and then supplier footprint, which is really important to understanding where parts are coming from, how they're coming to you logistically, how often, uh, and so on and so forth. And then uh, DFMA, if you do DFMAs. Uh, so those those are the things that, that really are tools that we use specifically in the value of the and something they use in other things, but some of the tools I use here are really help you to look at the overall total process of what you're doing, um, not just um, understanding your process from a competitive point of view, from the voice of the customer, from a, from a what, you, what you're currently doing today, um, and understanding your suppliers and what they're doing and what parts are coming from, uh, your um, quality, not only quality internally at your organization, but supplier quality, and also warranty quality, uh, and then also looking at uh, you know things we want to make sure we, that we go back and ver verify with your uh, DFMA or the PFMA. Okay, so in the in the the first um, the second phase of our workshop is called the function analysis or function phase. Okay, in the function phase we uh, do three four three major things. We first of all we identify random functions. 
And this is just an example of a chart where we identify random functions for a particular uh, component. This is actually for a micro microwave oven. But what we have here is we have the major components of that microwave oven listed on the left-hand side of this chart. The magnetron, the uh, high voltage transformer, the heating element, the structural components, the cooling fan motor, and so on and so forth. For each of those components, we'll list what the overall uh, cost is for those components. And then what we'll do is for each, uh, well, for the overall system, which is the combination of microwave oven, by the way, this is a combination of microwave oven, so not only is a microwave, it's a convection oven and it also has a broiler oven in it. Very common in uh, Europe, not as, not as common in here in the U.S., more common in Europe because the kitchens are so, so, so small, they don't usually have room for toaster ovens and microwaves and full ranges in the same kitchen. So uh, this product uh, is very popular in Europe because it combines the functions of a microwave oven, of a convection oven, and a broiler oven, or toaster broiler as we call it here in the States. So ba basically the overall uh, function for that device, for the, this combination of oven, is to heat either food or beverage. You want to heat it uh, to, to a certain temperature. Um, and then we have major components, you know, the magnetron. What does the magnetron do? Well, it has to generate the microwaves. It has to convert energy, from electrical energy to microwave energy. It has to connect circuit. It has a electronics that has to be connected, all right? What does the high voltage transformer have to do? Well, it has to also convert energy and connect circuit. What does the heat element has to do? Well, it has to generate radiation and connect circuit. So each one of these components then will be a, a will have verbs and nouns, an active verb, measurable noun, a very generic verb noun combinations. There's no nothing in here that's going to be specific like a motor or a, uh, uh, it's not going to say, you know, need mic, mic, magnetron. It's, it's, what does the magnetron do? Okay, the magnetron has to generate microwaves, it has to generate er, energy. So basically, generic verbs and nouns of, of what that component has to do. A wiring harness connects circuit, has to ensure, ensure safety. Um, that clock has to display time, has to, re, to register the warranty, um, the enhanced appearance. So these are various things that uh, these individual components might have to do. So we basically would, would take this chart and for, for any given product, we would break these down into, if, it, if a product has hundreds of parts, we would break it down into subsystems, maybe into pumps or, or motors or uh, piping systems, pipes or, or electro harnesses, whatever. We break it down into major component systems, but because each, basically each com major component grouping is gonna have the same functions. Uh, so if it's a, well, it's, you have one wiring harness or five wiring harnesses in your in your system, they're all going to pretty much do the same thing, connect circuit. All right. Um, so basically, we develop this first off by developing good random functions for each of the for the system as a whole and each one of those components. After that, then we would um, go into bring all those functions that we develop uh, into what we call a fast diagram, and a fast diagram stands for function analysis system technique. It's a way of taking all those functions we generate on that previous page and organizing them in a way that will allow us to ensure that we understand how this product works, not only from a functional point of view, but also from what the customer needs. What it meets customer needs. It has to meet customer needs, it has to meet performance needs. So uh, we wanna make sure we include everything on this fast diagram. On this critical path, this, this we call this critical function logic path, this path right here, that basically is the path that has to make logical sense, that's why I call it a logic path, going from left to right and right back to left. So in the how direction, we ask the how question, um, how do we enhance taste with a microwave oven? And that's really why people buy in my, a combination microwave ovens, because they don't want to eat the food cold out of the refrigerator, they want to heat it up, okay? So the, the how do we heat the, how do we do that? How do we enhance the taste? By heating the food or by heating the beverage. And that's the basic function of what the microwave combination microwave oven or broiler oven has to do. It has to heat the food or beverage. The way a microwave oven, a combination microwave uh, broiler um, convection oven does that is three different ways. First of all, it can connect 
generate convection, and generate convection is the connect is the convection portion of the of the of the machine. Okay, it can activate molecules, and that's the microwave portion, or can generate radiation, and that's the broiler oven portion. Okay, so actually there are three different ways that that this combination uh, microwave convection broiler oven has to heat the food. It can generate convection, it can activate molecules, or it can generate radiation. We're going to keep asking the how question as you go from the left to right, and then the why question going the other direction. But let's finish with the how direction first. So how do we generate convection? By circulating air. How do we generate molecules? By generating microwaves. And how do we generate radiation? That one really goes right up to convert energy. And these other two also go to convert energy. Okay, how do we um, circulate air by converting energy, and how we generate microwaves by converting energy. So all three of these go into conversion of energy. We're converting electrical energy into heat energy or radiation energy or uh, movement of air and heat and heat. So basically all three of those go back into convert energy, okay? And then how do we convert energy? Well, we need, we need a connect circuit, okay? We've got to connect the electrical circuit. Uh, how we connect the circuit? In a microwave, combination microwave, there are two ways to connect a circuit. You first of all, you have to select the cycle where you want to be in the brother operation or the microwave operation or the convection oven operation. So the selector switch to select which way you want, which, which function you want at that point, particular point in time. Uh, there's also um, a way you can, you have to be able to receive power. If this device does not receive power, then you don't, none of this happens. You have to, this device has to receive power. So there's actually two ways that circuit's connected. It's connected manually by someone physically selecting a cycle. And how does someone do that? Well, you have to apply force. You gotta turn a knob, push a button. So that's outside the scope of our project. The scope of our project is between these scope lines, between the left scope line and the right scope line. That's the, that's the project we're actually studying. And <clears throat> so we apply force. That's what we as a person have to do. And why we apply force to turn a knob, push a button, so we can select the cycle. Apply force is outside the scope. It's not something we have to do. It's not the responsibility of the microwave to do that. We receive power. We receive power. How do we receive power? By delivering power. Again, the microwave doesn't deliver power, but the power company delivers the power. They deliver power to our house, to our business, wherever, wherever we are, we use the microwave. It's the power company's job to deliver the power. What we do then is why we why they deliver power so we can receive that power. Okay, why we deliver why they deliver so we can receive it and use it. So again, that's out deliver power is also outside the scope of our project because that's not something that the microwave does. It actually is something that we need. And it's an input. That's why I call it a low order function, but the microwave does not really deliver power, nor does we apply force. So and let's ask the why question going in the opposite direction now. So why do I deliver power? Why do I why do the power can deliver power so we can receive that power? Why do we apply force so we can select which mode, which cycle we want to be in for this device? We want to be in the broiler oven mode or the convection oven mode or the microwave oven mode. Why do you do both of those things so we connect the circuit? Why do you want to connect the circuit so we can convert the energy? Why you want to convert the energy so we can circuit the air and generate microwaves and also generate radiation? Why you want to convert, connect, circulate air so we can generate convection? And why you want to generate microwaves so we can activate the molecules? Why you want to generate convection? Why you want to activate molecules? Why you want to generate radiation so we can basically heat our food or beverage? And then again, why you want to do that to enhance our taste? So basically, this logic path, referred to as a critical function logic path, all uses functions. It has to make logical sense going left to right and right back to left. Also, you see here that we have some project objectives, things that the, this device has to do uh, that maybe don't belong on the critical path, but are, are important, okay? They're important functions, some one-time functions and some all-the-time functions. Project objectives might be things like illuminate the interior. Would the product work without the interior being illuminated? Sure, it would work without the, without the inside being illuminated. But there are some customers that would not buy a microwave unless you could have a light on the inside 
And that's what's illuminated when you open the door or, or if you turn the light on even when the door is closed. So these people had some project objectives that it's a cost adder, basically. Most of these project objectives are cost adders. Um, resistant environment. Do we make a product that resistant environment? Sure, but customers wouldn't be happy if the thing rusted out uh, or corroded in a few years. So they, so resistant environment is something we have to do. We have to plate or coat all the materials to make sure that it does, that it does resist the environment. Maintain integrity structurally. We have to make sure the product is strong enough. So the first people slam the door, it doesn't break the glass, it doesn't damage the machine. So obviously those are things that maintain integrity is important for longevity. Ensure safety, absolutely very, very important. It make sure we have a good door seals and good door locks so the door stays closed and seals the microwaves inside the oven so they don't get outside the oven when we're during use. And enhance the content. Obviously, we can't even get into the microwave unless it has a door. So we have to go and access the content inside. So one-time functions protect the product. You only do that one time. Basically, we do it from the time that that product leaves your factory or my factory into your for customer's home. We we'll put it in a box. We put it in some uh, cardboard, some foam, whatever to protect it during transit. But once the customer gets that, most times they throw the box away. They don't use the box. That might get uh, uh, used for uh, for campfire to burn burn up something, but uh, basically people don't use the box. So it's a one-time function. You should use one time, but it's a very important function because if you don't have the box, the likelihood of getting it to the customer without damage is very very small. Small. And you have to register the warranty. You only use do that one time. For one time, you register the warranty. So we call those one-time functions. All the time functions are things that a customer is willing to pay for and really customer driven things that the customer needs and, and, he, and he tells you he needs them. He wants to buy a microwave that enhances the appearance of his kitchen. He won't buy an ugly looking microwave. Believe me, they, the microwave's aesthetics is very important. So enhanced aesthetics, enhanced appearance is important. Display time, most people buy microwaves today, they use as a multi-purpose device. They want, they want to be able to tell time in their kitchen with maybe without having a separate kitchen clock. So the microwave, the clock on the microwave is very important to them. So they, but they want to pay extra money for that microwave to have that clock on there. They will want to pay money for to ensure reliability. The reliability is important to them. So, and then inform the customer how you use the microwave. Obviously, an instruction manual, uh, service repair manual. Those things are important so that people know how to service the product and how to uh, uh, use the product. So these are the things the customer is willing to pay for, and he's, and, he, but, and, and they give him value that he has value because of those things. So they're basically called all-time functions. So that's uh, the basic development of a FAST diagram. You see in this FAST diagram, we have three different ways here. And these are called OR gates. And those are three different individual ways you can get from this function. Whoops, i go back here. Oops, there we go. All right, now back to the right slide. Okay, there are three different ways that these functions can be done, and uh, that this, the, the, this, the one, these functions can be done, and they're referred to as OR gates. Which, just like in electrical terms, uh, this would be like a series, a, a parallel circuit. You could go this way. You could use just the convection portion of the oven. You could use just the microwave portion, or you could use just the uh, broiler oven. So there are three different ways this oven can be used. They're independent of each other. So if the circuit was broken here or broken down here, you could still use the microwave portion. Or if it was broken here or here, you could still use the convection portion. So basically, they refer to as OR gates. Um, so that's how we'd use a, a develop a FAST diagram. And FAST diagrams can be developed for any kind of product or process. And they're really valuable to make sure you understand the product from a customer point of view, make sure you understand all the customer functions, from a performance point of view, one-time functions are, are sometimes forgotten, and some project objectives are cost drivers, but necessarily don't belong on the critical path. Again, any kind of product or process can be used, can be developed using this type of approach. And it really helps you make sure that, you, that, that nothing has been left out. You really totally understand the, the product or process you're studying, and you'll get the best value when you make sure you, you use this process because you won't have, won't have left any functions all the functions on that previous list need to be on this function diagram. So if those functions are developed by the team, 
on the previous chart, um, all these functions here are important, and these and that's why they're on here, okay? And if these functions weren't important, then we wouldn't list them, okay? So all these functions are on this, this, this next slide right here, okay? So all the functions are on here. All right, after we develop the FAST diagram, the next step then is we go and develop what we call a function resource matrix, all right? Uh, a function, function resource worksheet. And this is what a function resource matrix looks like for this microwave oven. Basically, it has all those components listed on the side along with their cost. That gets displayed automatically. I have all those macro driven. So once you develop your bill material in these in my forms, all this all this whole chart will be developed automatically. All these components will come over automatically. All the costs will come over automatically. The function, you have to still put the functions at the top, okay? But um, then you, what you want to do by this chart is you're going to try to understand from a functional point of view which functions are costing the most amount of money for your product or process. This helps you to pr prioritize those functions by cost. It could be it mostly cost, but you can prioritize them by timing, you can prioritize them by schedule, you can prioritize them by risk. There's lots of ways you can prioritize functions. It depends upon what, how, what the client is interested in, or by quality, uh, you know, various things you can, you can evaluate. Most times cost is, is the bottom line because quality and schedule and delivery, those all have cost implications. So I use cost quite heavily, but you can use, I've done workshops where schedule is more important. And so we, all, we looked at schedule as the criteria versus cost. Okay, in this situation, uh, we've got all the components listed. We've got the functions listed at the top of the, along the horizontal axis. Those are the same functions that we had on the random function identification worksheet and the same function we had in the FAST diagram. Those all were the 21 functions, whatever it was. We got those all included up here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take all those functions and we're going to rank those functions against the, comp against the components to see which of these functions has a direct, direct correlation to these components, all right? Well, the magnetron, it does definitely has a direct correlation to activating molecules, has a direct correlation to converting energy, has a direct correlation to connecting circuit, a direct correlation to generating um, microwaves, a direct correlation to resist environment, and to ensure reliability. So what we do next is we say, okay, from a percentage point of view, what is the highest cost of the that Function in that for that component. In other words, if we didn't have that component, could what 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 if which of these functions could we not do? Okay. Well, they, this this team decided that about the main function of the magnetron was to generate microwaves. So they said about 60% of the cost of this micro, of this magnetron should be assigned to to generate microwaves. That's just really its main function. That's really the main purpose of it. However, there's still another 30% that we put into for a gen for actually a molecule because that's a that's a way we that's also very important. We put some uh, money in here for connection circuits. There are some uh, connectors on on the magnetron that have to be connected. Uh, we put some in here for for connect circuit. You have to have a connector uh, on there. Uh, so much money to convert energy. You, you have different levels of magnetron, so you, but this we want one that's going to be fairly efficient. You pay a little more money for one that's more efficient, so we had to put about four percent penalty for that, and about resist environment, maybe corrosion protection, maybe two percent for some corrosion protection, and reliability. We thought there's about two percent improvement in reliability. We could get a cheaper magnetron, but probably the customer wouldn't be happy with it. So we thought there's about two percent penalty for the level of magnetron that we were using. So we just estimate those roughly, you know, but uh, uh, so. You know, plus or minus 5% is not a real big deal at this point. Because at the end of the day, when we would put all these functions together, um, and you see some of these functions don't have any relationship to the magnetron, they're just leaving blank, all right? Same thing with the high voltage transformer, the control panel, cavity, and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, we will have a functional percentage from highest cost to lowest cost, all right? And in this case, the highest cost function was to connect, to convert energy. Uh, tw about 20% of the total cost of this micro microwave was to convert energy, all right? So 
obviously that makes sense because the Megatron is very expensive and, and the turntable motor is expensive, so those things are expensive. So uh, that, that, that made a lot of sense to the team. Uh, this log, light bulb has, you know, all these various things that have to do with motors and fans, turntables, all, all cover energy. So that made sense. So we, so the reason we prioritize the functions is because we want to go to the next phase, and that's the creativity phase. We want to create ideas on the highest cost functions first, because if we have, let's say, 35 or 40 functions that you develop in a workshop, you may not have time to get to all 30 or 40 functions to, to develop ideas for them. Uh, and some of these functions are worth very little money, or register warranty, 0.005%, okay, very small. We're not going to probably spend a lot of money on how to register the warranty differently, okay? We may come up with some ideas, but that's not going to be a big focus for us because it's a, it's a very small percentage of the total cost. Only 2% of the total cost is to register the warranty. We want to get to the, the big ticket items first, the ones that cost the most amount of money from a functional point of view, not from a, from a cost of the components, but from a functional point of view, and uh, understand what, what is the other ways we can perform those functions, okay? So that's why we prioritize these functions to understand what is the highest cost function, second highest cost function, so on and so forth. Uh, and then from here we go to the next uh, part of the phase, function uh, ideas by brainstorm ideas by function. But before we do that, I'm going to get out of this and show you a real live example from a workshop we I did in um, Japan a couple years ago. Uh, this uh, was a control system for industrial uh, air conditioning system that is used in a large plant. And so we put down, the, this is with a company called uh, JCI Hitachi, a joint venture between JCI and Hitachi. Um, they make uh, uh, these very large uh, industrial air conditioning systems uh, that hang from the ceilings of the plants. Um, so this is, uh, this is what they came up with for their various functions. So the overall, we had three different teams on this, on this product. We had a controls team, we had a refrigeration team, and we had a structures team. So this is just the controls team. So the control system has to be able to control the unit. That's the overall part, uh, focus for the control system. We have the transformer and the, some the uh, printed circuit board, PCBs, and the wire and the sensor and terminal strips, so on and so forth. And we put the verbs and nouns, active verbs, measurement nouns for all these. We then put together a fast diagram, and I'll try to blow this up just a little bit. Okay, see it better. Okay, we put together a fast diagram. And this fast diagram does the same thing. We have our major uh, critical function logic path, and then some project objectives, some all the time objectives. Uh, then from there, we went into our build material entry. This is where we enter the various components of our build material, all right, uh, with, the, with the, all the various costs of the various parts of the build material. We end these, these components and these costs. This is what translates automatically to the next slide, which I'm going to show you, which is the function resource matrix slide, okay? And it also accumulates, there's a cumulative, so you can see which the cost of, of each of those components are from a total cost point of view. In this case, the, the printed circuit boards were 50, almost 52% of the total cost for the control system, all right? Uh, so almost 100 hours out of 194 uh, was just in the uh, PCB boards. Okay, so all these functions roll over, all these components roll over the next chart, which is the function resource matrix worksheet. And again, this is also macro driven. So when I put numbers in here, for instance, on the PCB, we had, uh, it has to convert voltage, it has to transmit a signal, it has to receive a signal, it has to regulate flow, it has to control speed, ensure safety, uh, connect circuit, and reduce noise. So those are the things this PCB has to do. Um, so they, they put down their ranking as how much percentage of the cost was. When we put the percentage down, is this, let's say in this case it was 10% was to convert voltage. We put 10% here, that calculates, takes 10% of this number and automatically puts that in says, okay, so uh, of that ten dollars, ten dollars and nine cents is of the hundred dollars and hundred dollars and eighty six cents, hundred dollars and ninety cents basically roughly, that uh, ten point oh nine of it, ten percent is just to uh, convert the uh, voltage, all right? Another 25% is to transmit the signal, okay? So again, it just automatically multiplies these out. So you can say, okay, if I didn't have to, for instance, if, if this PCBA didn't have to regulate flow, well, if it didn't have to regulate flow, I could maybe take 
reduce the cost of my PCBA by, by about 4%, okay? Or because that, that, I wouldn't have to regulate flow, all right? Um, or if I, if I have to potentially reduce noise, I take another 3% out, okay, if I have to reduce noise, all right? So what this does is it helps the team to say, hey, what, what are we actually paying for this, these print circuit boards in, in a functional terms, all right? And what's that function really costing? What are the components on that, PC, on that PCBA that actually are driving that function? So it makes teams really get deep in, into the, in the weeds and make sure they justify the design as final from a functional point of view. Is that design function what it's, rich, what it's really costing them and it should, and it should cost them that amount of money? That amount of money. Wiring harness, same thing, uh, sensor, you know. At the end of the day, again, we have this nice chart that shows uh, this, when you hit the sort ranking button, it sorts all these functions automatically from highest to lowest cost, all right? And we see in this case, our highest cost is the transmit signal. And about uh, of, the third, of the $194, about $34, $35.40 was this transmit signal. Another $29 was convert energy. Third was the twenty-two dollars was the control of the circuit, followed by by uh, received signal another twenty-two dollars, and then the drain the condensate another twenty-two dollars. All those were color coded in we call like an orange because they're all fairly high. You know they're they're from twenty-two all the way up to, to thirty-five. So that's these first five. You can see they're fairly they're fairly high, and, and there's quite a difference between those and the next group next group. Okay. So I kind of color code them all orange, so you can see that on this curve, the ones that are the highest, I color code those. I could have had the first two maybe red, and then I just use three colors to make it a little simpler. So, uh, so these are all orange. The next group is yellow. The next five are yellow. These these are all yellow, and then the last few are very insignificant cost, and I color code them as green. These last three here. Again, you can break this up into three or four different colors, five colors, six more colors, wherever you want. I just try to keep it simple with about uh, three or four different colors to make it as simple as possible to see, you know, what are the, the highest cost drivers and the, the lowest cost drivers. And then we may focus in, in the next part of the workshop on focusing on those highest cost drivers first and how we're going to transmit signal, how, what other ways we can transmit signal, what other ways we can convert energy, and so on and so forth. So let's get back to the PowerPoint and uh, go back to presentation mode here. Okay. All right. So in the brainstorming phase, we're going to brainstorm ideas by function, not by components, but by function. Okay. So this is that chart. Again, we'll put all of our functions in here. Okay. Highest cost function first. And and we'll try to come up with maybe 25 to 30 ideas as to how, what are some other ways we can brainstorm that highest cost function. Once we brainstorm all those ideas, we'll put the second highest cost function. And maybe we'll try to come up with another 20 or 30 ideas as to how we can do that function. And we'll put the third highest cost function here, 20 or 30 more ideas how we do that one, okay? So what we're going to do is prioritize our creativity, not just randomly, but prioritize it by highest cost functions. How is that function being done in another industry, in another product, in another uh, component, uh, or so, you know, any way we can think of how that function might be able to be done outside of what, what we're doing today? Different materials, different process, different uh, uh, suppliers, whatever it might be. How is that? How can that function be done differently? Then from there we go and uh, evaluate the ideas. All right. There's a couple different tools I use for evaluation. Again, one is referred to just as a uh, A, B, C, D, E, F matrix, and one's just an A, B, C, D matrix, all right? The A, B, C, D matrix is usually used up front in a workshop where the product is very early in the design development phase. It has not been, to, been fully designed. It's not been put in production yet. It uh, is, doesn't even have prototyping done. It's just a very early, even pre-concept, or at least early concept. Not, no, no drawings have not been solidified at this point. Because then we'll just break it down into these four groupings. Is, it, is a new idea fairly easy to do from a technology point of view? Um, and can we do it with the timing? Is it fairly easy to do? Uh, or is it more difficult to do versus A and B? 
that's your fixing easy difficulty. And then savings, is it bigger savings or smaller savings? If it was easy to do, but not as big of a savings, then we put down the C idea. If it's hard to do and not as big of a savings, we put down the D idea. An A idea would be an idea that has, it's fairly easy to do and high, has high savings. And a B idea would be hard to do, but still has high savings, all right? So we just put, and again, we, the team would decide what the break point is between high and low from the savings point of view. At the end of the day, it does make a lot of difference because we combine A and C ideas together in the same project plan or business case. I call them business cases. But, uh, uh, and then same thing with the Bs and Ds. Now, for the products that are further down the developed product development pipeline, if they've already got uh, prototyping done, they've got most of the drawings complete, they're um, going to go into production fairly soon or, or don't go into the validation, final design validation, then we may want to go into what we call the A, B, C, D, E, F matrix. And this is works very similar to this one, except now we've got three major groupings here. We have what we call a running change, a digit change, or a mile change. A running change, what I mean by running change, that means an idea that we can move forward with without customer notification. We've got control over the design. We've got control over what, what we're doing. Maybe it's a supplier change, but as long as we value the supplier, it'll be the same product, same component. We don't have to value the supplier with the, with the, with the uh, client, our final client. As long as we do it internally, we're, we're acceptable to them. So it may be a running change. A change we can make without notifying our customer is, is, is not, it's, it's backward compatible, no problem with, with uh, backward compatibility on the field. And then that would be, a, again, A idea would be high savings, D is slower, slower savings. A B's and E's are things that we do need to go to the customer with the notification. We need a change, a digit change in the drawing. And maybe it goes from an A to a B, a C to a D or whatever. We need some kind of a drawing control on it. It means that we need to make some kind of a modification to the drawing that will require uh, maybe the parts service community to be notified or the parts community, uh, people out in the field. Uh, so maybe even the uh, potentially uh, distribution network. So that would be a digit change. Again, doesn't mean we can't do it, but we may need some customer notification to do those. We may need to go back and change uh, service manuals. So that would be a BOE change. A CNF change is basically a change that, hey, we, this is a great idea, but there's just too much inertia to do this right now. We've got too much tooling invested. We've got too much money. We can't, we can't make the payback, won't pay for the tooling change. So we want, we want, like the idea, I think it's a great idea, but next time we come out with a new model with new tooling, then that's when we'll look at the idea. So they're put into a, a, a future hopper for future uh, planning, for future parts, and when that new model does come out, then we'll pull out those ideas and make sure we kind of do it, right, try to do it right from the beginning. So those are the C's and F ideas. So those ideas then would be put in this column here where it says rank, okay, oops, rank here that uh, we put in this column, all right? And then uh, once we get all the ideas together, we will sort by uh, A's and D's. So we have all the A's and D's together because I don't care if it's an A idea or a D idea. If it can be done the same in the same time frame, basically with the same running, same as the running change, um, we'll try to put them together with and with with time. There's another column here that says uh, uh, timing or type. That basically would be can we is that three months? Can we do these ideas in three months? In six months, nine months, twelve months, how how we started today, how long would it take us to implement these ideas in production? Uh, it's very, a very simple change. We do it maybe two or three months. Is it more complicated change? We've got to change some tooling. Maybe it's gonna take six months. Maybe it's even more complicated, we've got to get some validation testing from the customer, it might be nine months, or maybe in a year, okay, twelve months. So we'll put these together in groupings by timing and by by, by age. B's, D's, by A's and D's, B's and E's, C's and F's, and then by timing. And then we'll go and that's what we call prioritizing ideas. And then we'll go to our next phase, which is the development of business cases, okay? So in this previous chart, we also had a place, let me just back up here, in this previous chart, go back, back a slide. We also have a place for GR, which means group. That's that's the group number, okay? That's the business case group number. 
So let's say we got all the all these ideas ranked in A's and D's, all can be done in three months. So if we got a bunch of A and D ideas that can all be done in three months, then we'll, then we'll group them, maybe we'll call it business case one or group number one. Maybe you have a bunch of ideas, A's and D's that can be done in six months. Well, that'll be a different business case. That'll be business case two because we don't want to hold those ideas up or hold the first group up. It takes only three months. So we can get some ideas, maybe a smaller change, but we can get some ideas and implement in three months. Let's get those done first. And wait, if you get to take other ones in six months, we'll do those next, okay? But let's get the ideas we can get quickly done first. It may be a smaller group, but let's get those uh, implemented quickly, all right? If there's some things that take a year, maybe we'll, we'll put those in a different group. There's probably some bigger savings opportunities, but it's gonna take a year to get that savings opportunity. So we don't want those ideas uh, you don't want ideas to be done in three months or six months or even nine months. It can be done in that short time frame to hold up to be done quickly. If we can get those done quickly, we'll, we should put them in a different group. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're developing business cases, all right? This is a, a business case format. Again, it's a, it's a format I've developed. It's, it's macro-driven micro, micro, uh, micro with various macros. And this is a condensed, there's obviously in all these boxes here, this expansion, I've, I've taken all the extra spaces out so you can see that one slide. I'll show you a real example in a few minutes here. But um, uh, this is a, uh, a, a, this is a sample with, you know, we're going to present these ideas to the management team. And we'll probably, if we've got like say um, a bunch of A and D ideas, we'll keep, every idea will be, have, have its own individual number. Let's say we have 10 ideas that are A's. Well, this one be A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Each one has its own individual number. And if you go back to this previous chart here, that here, uh, you'll see that in this chart, I have a uh, column here. It, for, this would be the A's. And here, once you get all my A's, you know, I sort by A's. Then this column would be the first A would be A1, the second A would be A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, so on and so forth. All right, so that's how you sort the A's out. And, 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 and so each idea would have its own number. So when you go to this chart then, then this chart would have all your A ideas, A1 to A5, A7, A22, D2, D, D10. A's and D's together would be combined in the same business case. The idea here is you want to combine as many different ideas in the same business case that can be done in the same time frame, in a three-month window or a six-month window or a nine-month window. Uh, so that would be one business case. We, I've had business cases sometimes with 15 different ideas. doesn't mean, in fact, different people may have to work on these different ideas. That's okay. We want to help the organizations work together, and maybe some person managing this as a, as a project manager, but whether some of the procurement team or some of the design team or some of the manufacturing team is working on the idea, that's that's – now, as important is the fact that we, if we get all the ideas going together at the same time, we can have this much savings in three months or in six months or in nine months, okay? So we'll combine ideas, and we'll have a general title here as to what the, what the overall is. We're going to optimize the structure. We're going to optimize the control system. We're going to optimize whatever it is we're going to optimize. And then for each of these A numbers up here, let's say we have A1, A3, A5, we're going to go through and get back. We're going to go through and and put in there um, in this column A1. What the what the current situation for A1? A2. What's the, what's the current situation for A2? And A3 or A5. What's the current situation? What are we currently doing today? So for every number up here, we're going to we have that number down here with us seeing what we're doing today. So we're doing today, we're doing today. And then down below, what, the, what, we, what, what we're going to do for the new design, all right? And for each one of those numbers. So it's very clear to the management team when we go through and view this at the management report, I mean, what the idea is, what, what's, what we're doing today, the, the current design, current process, and what the new or proposed design, new process is, all right? We have uh, a platform module set, which would be basically, you know, one mile or different miles, you may, or different platform may be used as different, different customer miles. So you may call them just different things in your company, but basically you want to say, can we just do this on this one particular uh, item we're signing this week, or can this be expanded to all the products in this same range, okay? And so 
we'll, that's what we look at uh, when we do this. Um, this whole section here is all um, macro driven, so there's no, this, all these numbers will be automatically calculated once all these other information is put in. We'll uh, look at annual savings opportunities from a quality point of view, uh, conversion, uh, maybe there's a labor savings out in the plant. If we make a design change, maybe we can also make some process changes, or process changes, it would also reduce cost. So maybe we can eliminate some headcount in the plant, we can reduce headcount. So those would be conversion changes or, or labor reduction. So so maybe he's got some quality improvements. Uh, maybe we improve the quality. Maybe we reduce some scrap uh, by doing making this change. Either some supplier scrap or maybe some scrap in our facility. Number, we do reduce the number of rejects, whatever it is. So all those will be uh, pull down menu. I'll show you that in a few minutes. In fact, let's just go right to that right now. I think it's easier to show this to you. Let me just go back into uh, an example. Uh, Try to find the one I'm looking for here. Okay, let's look at business case for the uh, controls team. Okay. Okay, this is a business case for that same workshop, the controls team, and they they have um, this is their business case number one. Uh, let's see. Uh, they, let's see. I guess maybe. They, they, well, let's see if I can find one that has numbers in it. Okay, easier to find one that has numbers in it. Let's see if I can find one that has numbers in it. Oh. Let's see. Okay, number one. And why is that showing up? Okay. All right, let's try to find another one. Um, what I want to show is I can show this to you anyhow right here. Um, so basically, uh, we would, there's a pull down menu. Let me show you the pull down menu here. This is where you'd have probably your advantages of the idea, your challenges, some whatever tooling costs you might have, whatever validation costs you might have uh, to implement the idea. There's a pull down menu here that has for a quality improvement or a conversion improvement or you have to notify marketing. So we could just click on that and, we, and that will click on whichever one it was. Let's say it's conversion improvement and it pulls up conversion. And we write down exactly what would happen, what the conversion is. We have a place for assumptions. We have a place for uh, all your material savings from a, from a uh, bill material point of view where what the current cost is today uh, the part number is the current cost of that part number, how many do you use per product uh, for the baseline, and then what the new is, we're going to the new part number, a new cost, uh, a new quality, maybe we're going to use the same part, but we're going from maybe from eight screws here to per product down to five screws per product, okay? So maybe the same part number, but the cost is the same, but the, the actual quantity will go down. But the annual volume here, and then all these numbers will calculate then what the volume is, what the actual savings, annual savings, because again, it's all macro driven. And what the part is, we have part number here, but the part description, it's going to be a magnetron, it's going to be a condenser, com compressor, whatever you, part you may look at. That would be the description part. Okay, so that's how we use the, the, uh, the this business case format. Um, at, at the bottom here, you also have a spot for actions, uh, what are the actions you gotta do to, to, uh, to make, get this project to move forward? Who's responsible for those, those actions? And how many weeks would it take to do those actions? So it's really kind of a project plan. It's not just a bunch of ideas. It's the ideas how we're gonna implement them, who's gonna be responsible, how long will it take, what will be the costs involved? And so we view these with the management team at the end. We also put together a status, risk status. So from a technical point of view, from a timing point of view and from a cost point of view. And it has a pull down menu, you know, red, yellow, green, and it has a, a code here to tell you if you have supplier quotes, it would be green. If it's just an engineering estimate, it would be yellow. If there's no support for numbers, it would be red. And then take all these three numbers together and, and calculate an overall percentage of confidence the team is today when they come up with the idea, we're 80% confident that we can get these ideas moved forward. 60% confident, whatever the confidence level is, you put that here. 
Okay, so that would tell us, that would give us the opportunity and space to do this, and uh, I'll go through this in more detail during a workshop. I wanted to show that to you. So, um, so long-term effectiveness. Multiple options are available and need to be tailored to your individual organization, okay? I'll discuss two of that I've used, that the pros and cons, um, and the reporting structure of these. In addition, I will discuss other options I've also seen that work very well. And the important thing to remember is that, is that your organization needs to do what's best for your, for, for your organization, all right? All right, so my first exposure to uh, doing this was with uh, a company called TRW Automotive. It's now ZF. I uh, started in January 1997 with that organization. Um, after having great success in the seatbelt division of that company, they went globally, went globally uh, with all the divisions um, with that process. We developed a global value engineering organization, um, and that team is, was with global directors for all three of the major business units. Uh, restraints, which include airbags and seatbelts, braking systems, steering and suspension systems, and then we had three smaller divisions. They had senior managers for those three smaller divisions. They were also responsible. So we had a couple uh, parts of the organization that worked really well. Uh, and in fact, this is the overall organization chart. When I left the organization, there were 78 people working full-time in the organization. Uh, I was their staff specialist that was training people and leading the process in the, in the organization. I worked for the global VP of engineering. Uh, I'm sorry, I worked for the global VP of, of of uh, engineering who worked for, directly for the global VP of engineering. So I worked just really two under the, the global VP of engineering for the organization. Uh, but we had North America, European divisions for restraints, for braking systems, for steering systems, and again, the senior manager for the, the smaller business units. What we did there at TRW was we each, we, I trained the VE specialists as uh, ABSs or CBSs. Um, and they took the pro pro projects from cradle to grade. Those all projects were, were they had total responsibility for all projects. Um, they were responsible for the, each one had annual metrics they were responsible for. And uh, they were, the, the company covered, covered all the certification costs and they wrote technical papers. They, the company was really very supportive of the process. And then became a, a corporate member of Savior National. Um, that, I, I was with them for 11 years and uh, we took a retire, early retirement with them to join Whirlpool Corporation. They offered me a, a pretty good option to, to leave uh, TRW, so I took an early retirement with them and joined Whirlpool in 2008. They had a little different philosophy. Um, they called their department Design for Value. Um, I basically established that department when I got there. Um, they, had, they used to re, uh, globally regional develop managers in each region. Uh, Whirlpool had a good execution team. They knew how to execute ideas. They didn't have good ideas to execute. Um, whereas TRW didn't even have um, ideas uh, or how to or how to execute. They didn't have an execution team. So that's why the guys in at Whirlpool at TRW took the jobs from career to grave. They actually went through and helped to execute the ideas. So again, that's yet to develop with, with what your organization needs and needs your organization. We had the regional managers in each of the regions, and we all, Whirlpool is also a corporate member of SAVE. So this was my, when I left in 2014, this was my, my team, uh, three guys and three gals working for me uh, in India, uh, Europe, this is Europe, um, Latin America, China, North America, U.S., and North America, Mexico. And these are the products they have responsibility for in each of the, of the regions. They have responsibility for all the plants and all the products in their regions. So they were, they were leading the process but they were not executing the ideas. Um, they were just leading the process and developing the ideas, uh, business case that, or, with, with all the various products. So, um, the advantage, uh, again, they, they became C ABS and CBS through my mentorship. Um, they, we tracked the ideas, uh, helped me move global blocks, make sure we had in time and implementation, time and implementation of the ideas, and ideas with percentage of savings, certification covered by the company. Differences, when, uh, for pros and cons of the TRW system, each, member, each team member was responsible for the ideas, uh, focused on the execution of the implementation. Uh, and there was metric, it was everybody's metric in the company, it, it loses emphasis on hot jobs that come along. Each team member had roughly a $2 million 
annual goal, their responsibility to save $2 million for their particular metric for the year. A Whirlpool uh, decided that they wanted to do more workshops. They, they, they knew they had an execution team, but they needed good ideas. So we, we had senior managers that were responsible for working with, and they were able to carry out a lot more workshops and cover a lot more different products by doing this, okay? And so, and each of them were we had an average of about $6 million. Now, they're still responsible for annual savings, but basically the savings was a result of what the, the ideas that they generated. Um, again, uh, the pros and cons of the automotive automotive system was each team was responsible for it. They were more focused on exercise and implementation, uh, Lose emphasis on hot jobs, so I just went through all this thing out a second. Uh, okay. All right. So, making this sustainable. Top management commitment is a must. Okay. If you're going to succeed with this process in your company, top management commitment is a must. Um, depends on all departments that be fully engaged and on board or will fail because all departments are involved in your workshop from procurement to quality to marketing. And if you don't have all departments engaged, you're not going to be successful. The VM process must be cross functional to be sustainable. Uh, proper attention must be given to train and certification. Proper, serv proper recognition must be given along the way to have success. Uh, choosing the right VM leaders are uh, critical to your organization. Again, people who really uh, can lead the process. Um, someone that's re already respected within the organization today. Someone has the right skill sets, uh, staying product and process knowledge, uh, has you know, accomplished, uh, has been potential for leadership. Uh, a team player who works well independently as well as uh, works well in, independently, and the right professional with a proven track record. So that's basically what I want to present today. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I could go a lot further with a lot more details, but these are the kinds of things that I have to offer that I've done in the past. I, I do a 40-hour workshop. Um, actually, right now, it's the new workshop is only 32 hours. I got to get this updated. But there's a, I do a certification workshop to help you be, become uh, very, very methodology associates. Uh, I prepare them for the examination. I think having a certified program within your company helps to reinforce it. It gives it everyone a, that little extra edge. The, uh, the VMA program or the CVS program is the certification program is an internationally recognized program. It's like getting a, a PE license or a, a CPA license. It's, it's a, that's the extra extra credential you have that, that gives you that little edge in the marketplace. And it says that I, I, it doesn't come easy. There's some work you have to do, but it's worth it, I think. And both TRW and Whirlpool felt it was very very valuable to have the people certified. And I was able to get many of the people certified in that process uh, through the organization. And they became the experts for the process with their companies. I also do uh, have a, a, a secondary workshop, a 24-hour workshop, um, module two workshop. Uh, I can do non-certification workshops as well, but I come into your company for three or four days and work with your, your, your cross-functional team. I hold pre-workshop meetings ahead of time to make sure we're well organized. I, can, I work with, I do, I can do value enhancing tools workshops. I can do workshops on, on design for manufacturing, design for assembly, DFMA. Uh, I can do workshops with trees, uh, theory of inventive problem solving. Uh, so in lean, I do have a big experience with lean as well. So I can, I really combine all those and what I do with the engineering methodology. So these are the tool sets that I have to work with, and uh, I love to be able to work with the organization. So if there's any questions, I'll take any questions at this point um, at the end of my time. And I think hopefully it was helpful for you to see the tools in a little more detail.